I just turned 48 in January, and my wife and I celebrated our 22nd wedding anniversary. Things started getting rocky in our marriage about a year ago when my wife joined a co-ed baseball group. She's 42, and I initially thought she might be having a midlife crisis. During the COVID lockdown, she gained some weight despite her efforts to stay healthy, and it took a toll on her emotionally. With our kids out of the house, it was just the two of us most of the time. I never complained. Instead, I tried to encourage her as best I could. I understood that it's part of the aging process, and I've never been in great shape myself. To be honest, she's the attractive one, the type who enjoys receiving compliments, dressing up, and going out in public. Her job in marketing makes her value her image and first impressions. When COVID restrictions began to ease up, she felt the need to join active group activities. We considered various options, but the most convenient was a baseball group meeting three times a week with mostly male members. I wanted to join too, but my work schedule didn't allow it. I work as a plumber and often have late, long hours. My wife thinks I'm a workaholic, and honestly, I enjoy working because of the satisfaction I get from completing tasks. I work for a friend now. I used to run my own business, but it became too hectic for me with all the responsibilities. I just wanted to work and go home, leaving others to handle the additional tasks. After my wife joined the co-ed baseball group, I remember her first game. She was so exhausted her whole body was sore. I had to massage her feet and thighs when I got home, and she said she really enjoyed it. It sounds like you want me to rewrite the text you provided using plain language. I can definitely help with that. My wife started talking a lot about a guy named Craig. She said he was good at sports but was controlling and she didn't like him. She said he flirted with the women, was obnoxious, and badmouthed his ex-wife, although no one had seen her. He had been married many times and liked muscle cars. After a few games, she complained that he used to smoke a lot and would invite people to smoke with him after the games. She said he also sold drugs and got people hooked on them. She said he used to be a professional athlete before he had an accident and had problems with drugs. I asked her how she knew all this about him, and she said he wouldn't stop talking about it. Despite all this, everyone seemed to like him because he was funny, outgoing, offered to fix their cars for free, and gave away drugs. But my wife didn't like him. One night, she came home smelling like drugs. I asked her about it, and she said she tried it once because everyone else was doing it. This started happening every time she came back from the games. Once, after a game, she took a shower and I joined her. We became intimate, and I could taste the drugs in her mouth. I confronted her about it, and she said it was just a one-time thing and she didn't even inhale it. I was upset because she had always told our kids not to do drugs or give in to peer pressure, and here she was doing exactly that. I chose not to argue with her. I was surprised to see her acting this way. It wasn't the drugs that bothered me, it was her hypocrisy. She spent almost a month complaining about this guy, saying how awful he was, and then she went ahead and tried his drugs. In the following games, I noticed she continued to use drugs, trying to hide it by taking a shower, washing her sports gear, and brushing her teeth. Nevertheless, the odor lingered, but I refrained from confronting her again. I knew she would either lie or come up with some flimsy excuse and I didn't want to broach the topic. I was secretly relieved. Because I had something to hold over her head in case, she resorted to her usual self-righteous behavior. Thanksgiving was approaching and my three children came to visit. My wife was noticeably not there, which was strange because she usually cooked and hosted a big Thanksgiving party. She would prepare more food than we could eat. This time, she was gone all day. When she came back, I asked her where she'd been. She told me she'd been visiting friends. When I asked for more details, she said her car had broken down, so she took it to Craig to get it fixed. I questioned why she hadn't informed us, especially since it was Thanksgiving. Her response seemed insufficient to me. I asked her what was going on, as she was aware that Thanksgiving was approaching and her priority should have been spending time with the family, not fixing her car. I pointed out that most people spend the holiday with their families. She said she already told our daughter she'd be late and that our daughter should prepare the Thanksgiving meal. Even our children noticed her behavior change. They thought we were having problems because they believed we were arguing a lot, which was why their mom was making excuses and not preparing for Thanksgiving as she usually did. My daughter couldn't handle everything alone. My wife claimed she was sick and retired to bed after returning from the supposed mechanic trip to fix her car. For the first time in a long while, I had to take my wife and kids to a restaurant on Thanksgiving. My wife was in bed and I had to convince her to come to the restaurant with us. She wanted me to tell the kids that she was sick, but I insisted she should tell them herself. I didn't want to have to explain to my kids that their mom had been making new friends, smoking a lot and slacking. I was always at work and I couldn't monitor her every move. At that point, the idea that she might be having an affair hadn't crossed my mind. My daughter entered the room and noticed that something was off with her mom's behavior concerned. She came to her senses and realized she was acting unusually. She finally got up and started pretending like everything was okay. 
When we were at the restaurant, my kids noticed that she wasn't herself. She was making awkward jokes and seemed disconnected. After we left the restaurant, my daughter noticed that my wife seemed different, as if she didn't want to be there but was forced to. My daughter joked about what I had done to her mom and mentioned that my wife had lost a lot of weight. She wondered if her behavior was related to her extreme weight loss. I decided to be honest with my daughter. I told her that her mom had joined a baseball team, made some new, unusual friends and had started using pills with them. This had been going on for the past four months since she joined the baseball team. My daughter thought it was a joke, because my wife's actions were completely out of character. After Thanksgiving, my kids left and I talked to my wife about the need for change. I told her she couldn't continue acting like a college girl. At this point it still hadn't crossed my mind that she might be having an affair. I trusted her a lot and couldn't believe she would do this to me. The trouble started when I saw that our joint bank account, used for paying regular bills like groceries and utilities, was overdrawn. I got a notification on my phone that $1,200 had been withdrawn from the account. I tried calling my wife, but she didn't answer. I finished my work, cancelled the next assignment for the day, and decided to go home to check on her because something seemed off. When I got home, I saw a 1964 Pontiac GTO parked on the street, a car I hadn't seen before. I love classic cars, so it caught my eye. I parked behind my wife's car in the driveway and went to open the front door. I noticed that someone had hurriedly left through the back door. I assumed it was my wife since her car was in the driveway, and she had been working from home due to the lifted COVID restrictions. As I was about to open the door, the backyard door slammed shut. Believing it was my wife who I was in a hurry to ask her about the money taken from our account and why she hadn't been answering her phone, so I didn't see. I headed towards the backyard door and opened it. I heard the backyard fence being opened. This alerted me that something was amiss, because for someone to reach the backyard fence so quickly, they must have been running. Therefore, I concluded that it wasn't my wife and the only logical explanation was that it was a burglar or someone fleeing from me. The person, whoever it was, must have been running, because I made the necessary calculations to determine the speed needed to reach the fence within that specific time frame. The fence isn't visible when you open the backyard entrance door, since it's parallel to the building and parts of the structure block the view. To see who enters or exits the backyard through the fence gate, you have to enter the backyard itself. By the time I reached the backyard and opened the gate, the person had vanished. I surveyed the surroundings and noticed the unmistakable smell of MJ in the air, indicating that someone had been smoking here. Suddenly I heard my wife calling me from the house, so I hurried back. When I saw her, she appeared as if she had just taken a shower. I inquired about the person who had been smoking in the backyard and she denied anyone being there, asserting that she had smoked in the backyard earlier because she knew how much I disliked the smell. I told her that she clearly wasn't telling the truth, especially because of her unusual behavior over the past five months and her allowing people into our home. I asked her directly if she was having an affair and if it was with the person who had rushed off our property. She vehemently denied it and acted as though I were speaking a different language. I then questioned her about why she hadn't been answering my calls and the $1,200 withdrawal from our shared account which we used for paying our bills. She explained that she had lent the money to a friend in need and they would repay it as soon as possible. I was utterly bewildered. At this point it was hard to believe the words coming from my wife's mouth. They sounded like they were from either a gambler or someone obsessed with MJ. The information was too bizarre to comprehend. I inquired whether her friend thought she was a bank and why she hadn't asked for my permission before making such a large withdrawal. She became irritable. In response, I warned her that if she had given the money to her friends, there would be consequences. I made it clear that I expected the money back in the account by tomorrow. That evening I took the time to review all our bank statements and noticed that she wasn't contributing her fair share of money to the account. A significant portion of my wife's income is based on commissions, so the more hours she puts in, the more money she earns. I observed that she was only contributing about owner of the amount she was supposed to, which explained why the account balance was lower than usual and why I received a notification for the large withdrawal. I confronted her about not contributing her fair share and discovered that she was putting in only the bare minimum hours Riku required to maintain her job. I inquired about what she had been doing with her time if she wasn't working. She began making excuses, claiming she was constantly tired due to working out and playing sports to lose weight. She argued that the kids were no longer at home and we didn't need all that money anyway. I told her that if she decided to reduce her working hours, she should stop lending my money to her friends and cut down on hanging out with her MJ using buddies. I also insisted that she quit playing that sport. I gave her ultimatum, it was either our marriage or her sports and she reacted strongly. She hurled various insults at me, calling me insecure and saying I wasn't man enough. I informed her that if she continued to play, we might have to end our 22 year long marriage. She became furious that I would even consider ending the marriage over something seemingly trivial. 
She suggested that I should talk to someone because she believed I was being emotional and acting immature. I told her that she wasn't the same person I noticed a change in my wife ever since she started playing baseball and hanging out with new friends. Despite being home all day, she seemed different, she no longer took care of household chores and cooking as she used to. She was barely working and appeared to be indulging in recreational activities like a college dropout. She accused me of being jealous of her improving appearance in life, implying she might consider my offer, and then she angrily left the room. We had an intense argument throughout that night and I ended up sleeping on the couch the following day. She refused to speak to me or cook for me, hoping that I would apologize and allow her to continue her negative behavior, completely disregarding the unexplained withdrawal from my account. We didn't exchange words that day. The next day happened to be one of her baseball game days. Before I left for work, she attempted to grab my attention to see if I was serious about pursuing a divorce if she played her game as I was getting ready for work. She walked past me and loudly declared that she would do as she pleased, asserting that I couldn't interfere with her happiness. I remained silent, got dressed and left the house. I contacted a divorce lawyer in the afternoon to prepare a separation agreement. I wanted to surprise my wife, hoping she would realize the potential loss of her family due to her actions. Whether you might call it a midlife crisis or menopause, I believe that serving her divorce papers might jolt her out of it. The lawyer drafted a legal separation document and I picked it up after work. When I returned home, my wife was not there and I wasn't sure where she had gone. When she finally came home, I noticed she wasn't dressed for a baseball game. My plan was to serve her with the divorce papers, to emphasize that I was serious with the hope that she wouldn't sign them. Despite the challenges she had put me through, I still loved my wife and didn't want to lose her. My goal was for her to realize that she might end up divorced and without anyone to support her. She entered through the front door and I was waiting in the living room. She walked past me and kept ignoring me. Then she went to the kitchen to make food for herself. I left the couch to retrieve the divorce papers. She was still in the kitchen when I handed her the papers to sign. The expression of shock on her face, with wide open eyes and mouth, caught me off guard. I hadn't expected her next move. She pushed me and threw the divorce papers at my face, expressing disbelief that I would definitely follow through with this. She left the kitchen in tears, exclaiming that she couldn't believe I was taking these steps. She ran upstairs to the master bedroom crying and lamented that I had initiated the divorce proceedings even though she hadn't gone to the baseball game. I found myself in the kitchen, the divorce papers scattered across the floor, but I smiled because everything had gone as planned. I collected the papers and put them back in the folder. Maybe this had given her the shock she needed. Later that night I received a call from my daughter, who asked me why I was divorcing her mom over a baseball game. It's it turned out that my wife had complained to our daughter about me. At that moment, I knew I had already succeeded. Knowing my wife, I told my daughter that her mom visited the US during Thanksgiving and wasn't feeling well. I explained that her mom was too shy to ask for help herself, so she wanted our daughter to help. I didn't explicitly mention my suspicion of my wife having an affair but interestingly, my daughter remarked that it didn't seem like she was having an affair and encouraged me to work through this challenging period with her. We spent over an hour on the phone the following day before heading to work. My wife surprised me by preparing breakfast and lunch for the first time in about six months. She said sorry for everything she did to me and promised to start acting better. She said she thought about things and realized she was wrong. I told her I would give her a month to get her act together and if she continued to smoke and hang out with her friends, then I would have no choice but to proceed with the divorce. I also reminded her that the money needed to be repaid to my account and she agreed. We made amends and I left for work update. The following day, when I returned home, my wife and I had another conversation. She confided in me explaining that she's been under a great deal of stress due to how Coit has impacted her job, coupled with my heavy work schedule. She admitted that she had been seeking an escape. Initially, the baseball game provided some relief, but she eventually succumbed to the allure of MJ and began using it. She mentioned that it had a relaxing effect and helped alleviate her anxiety. For the first time, she revealed that she had been battling depression and had been taking medication for it. Surprisingly, she disclosed that since she started using MJ, her reliance on depression medication had gradually decreased. I asked her about the person in our backyard who had fled and she claimed there was nobody there. However, I could tell she was not being truthful. Regarding the money withdrawal, she apologized and asked me not to be offended, explaining that it might take her a while to replace the money because she used it to buy MJ. Although I was deeply upset, I chose not to interrupt the moment. My wife seemed regretful, as if she had a sudden realization. I hoped that after this, I could finally have my wife back. The next couple of days were relatively normal, as if we had returned to our usual routine. I came to terms with the fact that her smoking might not cease, since she claimed it helped with her anxiety and depression. I assured her that I wasn't overly concerned about her smoking. My main worry was the people she purchased it from, as those who deal with such substances are often questionable characters. 
Since my state doesn't permit MJ, she continued to smoke in secret, trying to conceal it from me as much as possible. I opted not to confront her to avoid a conflict which inadvertently made her think she was adept at hiding it. She began picking up extra hours at work and contributed slightly more to our shared account, although not to the extent she had before. I was responsible for the mortgage, the largest bill in our shared account was intended to cover various expenses. In the end, I was covering around 70 to 80 percent of the expenses. One evening, while we were watching TV together, her cell phone rang and she answered it, then walked into another room. From the other room, her infectious giggles filled the air. A few minutes later she returned to the couch and I asked her who it was. She got defensive and claimed it was just a friend. I found her reaction unusual, which raised a red flag. On another occasion I got home early and opened my fridge to get some beer, but it was missing. Since only my wife and I live at home our kids have moved out and she doesn't drink beer I wondered who might have taken it. I considered the possibility that she had cleared some space in the refrigerator, but it didn't seem likely. This led me to suspect that my wife might be inviting someone over without being entirely honest with me. Christmas came and went and my kids noticed that my wife was behaving better than she had during Thanksgiving, but I had a feeling she was just putting on an act. In January she began reverting to her old ways, smoking excessively, sleeping throughout the day and working less. When my birthday came, she didn't throw me a surprise party, buy me a gift or want to go out for dinner to celebrate. My kids called to wish me a happy birthday day. I reminded her that she had forgotten my birthday and she was surprised she had forgotten. I told her that she was smoking too much and it seemed to be affecting her memory. She explained she had marked it on her calendar but had forgotten and apologized to me. I first encountered the ring doorbell at one of my client's houses and we communicated through it. I hadn't known about the ring before, but I thought it was great that it allowed you to see who was at your front door in real time and it connected to your phone. In the back of my mind, I can considered using it to monitor my wife observing what she did throughout the day and who she was inviting into our home. So I purchased the ring doorbell and installed it in our house. Initially, when I installed the camera, my wife didn't pay it much attention. She knew I'd always been a gadget guy and considered it just one of my many useless gadgets, as she often called them. The ring doorbell was connected to my Wi-Fi, so I received notifications when someone was at our door and it recorded videos in the cloud that I could access at any time. On the first day after installation, while I was at work, I received a motion-activated video recording notification from the ring. I was busy and didn't have a chance to check my phone for at least an hour. When I finally checked the ring notification, I saw a man at our front door. He didn't even have to knock. My wife was already there waiting for him. She opened the door and welcomed him inside. It was clear that she knew him. The thought racing through my mind at that moment was that this could be the same guy who had dashed through my backyard, the one who'd been helping himself to my beer in my absence. Maybe this was Craig, the person supplying MJ to my wife, or even the man she might be having an affair with. I quickly checked the real-time camera feed and it appeared the man was still inside my house and hadn't left. I was 30 minutes away from home and hadn't even completed my current assignment. I informed the client that I needed to return and sped home as fast as I could. The man had been in my house for over hour and I monitored the ring camera on my phone as I drove. The video feed wasn't very reliable. While driving it kept freezing, so I decided to focus on the road instead, making my way home as quickly as possible to catch him inside my house. I felt my anger and anxiety building up. Upon arriving home, I only saw my wife's car in the driveway. I rushed inside, heading straight to the master bedroom. The room was empty, the bed was disheveled and the air felt stuffy. I couldn't tell if it was from my wife's shower or just the stagnant air. My wife was nowhere to be found in the bedroom, nor was the man. I checked the closet and under the bed. At that moment I heard the backyard door open, so I hurried downstairs to see who it might be thinking the guy might be trying to escape, as he had before. As I was halfway down the stairs, my wife emerged from her home office located downstairs near the kitchen. She had a shocked expression, eyes wide open, as if she'd seen a ghost. I noticed she was wearing only a white robe and she told that I'd startled her, asking why I was home early and why I seemed so anxious. I had to collect myself, not wanting to give any indication that I suspected a man had just been in my house, possibly involved with my wife, and that I'd narrowly missed catching them in the act. It started to sink in that I just missed them. I decided there was no need to confront her as I knew she would deny everything, even if I showed her the ring footage of him entering the house. Instead, I thought it best to wait and catch them in the act. From the look in her eyes I could tell she suspected something, was amiss, but couldn't figure out how I knew or why I wasn't confronting her. I came up with a random excuse, pretending to be searching for a tool, a Makita cordless metal hole punch. Although she had no idea what that was, I wanted to act as if everything was normal. While I could sense her trying to read my reactions, I descended into the basement, grabbed a random tool and returned to the main part of the house. She was still standing there, almost like she was in a state of shock and couldn't move. 
I went up to her and kissed her on the cheek before leaving the house, as I usually do. As I approached her, it was evident that she had been smoking not too long ago. I pulled back from her as if everything was normal, inquired why she was acting strangely and if she was okay. She replied with a yes and escorted me to the door. As I walked toward the driveway, I couldn't help but wonder how this guy managed to be with my wife and escape right under my nose. I believed this might have been the second time he had been with her and I had narrowly missed catching him. I considered the possibility that he might still be hiding inside the house. I decided to check the ring footage to see if he had already left. My wife was still at the door when I reached my car, just staring at me. I tried to act as normal as possible, but once I got into my work van. I felt paralyzed. I knew she was watching me from the partially open door, so I sat in my car pretending to look at my paperwork while checking my phone to confirm whether he had left the house. Indeed, he had left before I arrived home. I had just missed him again. As I sat there reviewing the ring footage, my cell phone rang and it was my friend, the person I worked for, asking why I left the client's place without completing the job. As the client was complaining, I was working on a bathroom renovation for the client and contemplated calling off the job for the day, but I knew it would be a hassle for another plumber to pick up where I'd left off. Therefore, I decided to return to work and finish the job for the client. I found it difficult to concentrate at work. Although my plumbing skills were second nature to me, my mind kept returning to the bewildering idea that my wife was willing to throw away 22 years of marriage for a MJ seller and some recreational time. I couldn't fathom how she transformed from a well-mannered wife with strict traditional values into a frequent MJ user, despite her promises to quit. After finishing my work that day, I couldn't bear going home, so I sat in my van. Contemplating my next steps, I visited a local bar, even though I don't drink much. Just to be around people at the bar, I ordered some beer and sat on a bar. Stool. Deep in thought, I came up with the idea of purchasing a video recorder and a GPS device to install in my wife's car, allowing me to monitor her movements. I went to a nearby electronic store but couldn't find a reputable GPS or hidden camera. I ended up using my phone to order one online, but I did manage to buy two voice-activated recorders, intending to place them in my bedroom in my wife's home office. When I returned home, my wife had prepared my favorite meal, something she used to do in the past. Especially when she felt guilty about something, I remained composed and pretended that everything was normal. After a while, I went upstairs to take a shower and join her for dinner. I even remarked that it was unusual for her to be making dinner, and she tried to insist that she always did. We both chuckled it off. I made an effort to conceal my pain and resentment toward my wife. However, after dinner I could no longer contain my emotions and I felt the urge to confront her. Instead, I decided to take the dog for a walk. I told my wife that I went for a walk, and taking the dog with me helped to clear my mind. I considered calling my daughter to inform her about her mom's affair, but decided against it, not wanting to involve her, fearing she might jeopardize my plans to catch my wife red-handed. I was seeking more evidence, although I already had some sum, I wanted to confirm that I wasn't imagining things. I had seen her, a fair partner, on my ring camera, a brown-haired, tall, skinny guy. I knew his face and could pick him out of a lineup. I just wanted to see how deep this situation went. When I returned home, my wife was already asleep. I didn't feel comfortable sleeping in the same bed where she might have been with her dealer, a fair partner, just hours ago. Sleeping in the guest room would arouse suspicion, so I decided to endure my discomfort and sleep next to her that night. I struggled to sleep, woke up in the middle of the night and installed the voice-activated recorder in her office in our bedroom. The following morning she woke up before me and prepared breakfast as if nothing had happened. It was easier for me to pretend this time compared to the previous day at work. That day I couldn't resist checking my ring camera regularly, even though I had set up notifications for any motion detected. My wife only left the house to go grocery shopping, as she had called me to let me know, and returned with bags. The second and third days were uneventful. She rarely left the house and I began to wonder if something was amiss or if she had caught onto my ring camera surveillance. So on the evening of the third day, after I had spotted the stranger at my door, I retrieved the voice-activated recorder, went to my car and started listening to the recorded conversations. It became evident that my wife had been spending hours on the phone with this man named Craig who was a part of her baseball group. From their conversation it seemed like my wife was no longer attending the games, but she had developed a close relationship with him. He was asking when he could come over, but my wife expressed concern that I had unexpectedly shown up at home one time, making her apprehensive about being intimate at our house. They couldn't be intimate at his place due to his girlfriend and three kids, and he didn't want to spend money on a hotel. He suggested they meet in a parking lot, but my wife refused to be intimate in that setting. She had a clear boundary. A parking lot was crossing the line for her. Her yet being intimate in our bed was somehow acceptable. He proposed that she come to his workplace, where they had been intimate before. But she was concerned about his business partner. Apparently, during Thanksgiving she went. 
To see him at his shop and his partner caught them. He co-owns a mechanic shop with his business partner and his partner didn't appreciate their workplace being used for such activities. Still, he was insistent on having my wife visit his place of business, even if it jeopardized their business relationship, all for intimacy with a married woman. Based on their conversation, it seemed like my wife was receiving MJ in exchange for intimacy, or at the very least a discount. That was the impression I got from their discussion. Lying in bed, I contemplated my next steps and how to proceed from here. I feared that my plan had backfired because my wife had grown suspicious, potentially missing an opportunity to confront her on D-Day the next morning. While taking a shower, I suspected my wife was smoking MJ daily and trying to hide it from me by using peppermint and mouthwash to mask her breath. I thought she might be using it to cope since she wasn't taking her medication. My plan was to find her stash and dispose of it, forcing her to invite him for more. The challenge was how to locate the stash without her knowing she was home all day, only leaving the house for a couple of hours. It seemed, I might have to thoroughly search the house to find it. However, I was reminded that my daughter would be visiting our house for the weekend to see her mom. They typically go to her mom's place in the countryside for the entire day, which would give me enough time in the house to search for her stash. This visit was not unusual, since they visited her mom about once a month. I had already returned the voice recorder to her office. The rest of the week was uneventful, looking ahead to when my daughter paid us a visit. She inquired about her mom's well-being and I assured her that everything was fine. I refrained from revealing anything to her as I suspected that she might inadvertently leave tip off my wife. My daughter isn't the best at keeping secrets. On Friday, the GPS and hidden camera I had ordered arrived. On Saturday morning, my wife and daughter set out to visit my wife's mother with them out of the house. I took the opportunity to listen to the voice-activated recorder in my wife's office. It confirmed my suspicions about the guy involved in her life, indicating he was a dealer possibly dealing with more than just MJ. However, I couldn't determine if my wife was using anything more than cannabis. I also learned from the recordings that the guy used to play for a minor league and was on the path to going pro until he had an accident which led to an obsession to painkillers. This was his downfall. In contrast, my wife didn't have any known traumatic experiences, so it baffled me why she was drawn to such a person and started using MJ. Her upbringing had been fairly normal and her recent revelation about depression caught me off guard. Perhaps it stemmed from the prolonged time she spent at home, potentially leading to weight gain. My wife retained her suspicions that I had discovered her affair, but when questioned about how she knew, she claimed ignorance regarding my sources. I surmised that she might have made this statement to deter him, as he was eager to meet her before she left with our daughter for the weekend. I installed the camera in both the master bedroom and the living room. My next task was to locate my wife's stash of MJ. I scoured the entire house, contemplating even hiring a sniffer dog, yet by the day's end I came up empty-handed, leading me to believe she either had nothing left or had taken it with her. Their return was scheduled for Sunday afternoon. While sitting on the couch watching TV, an idea struck me, I went outside to look for hiding spots in the backyard about an hour before the sun went down. I suspected that she might have buried her stash, but to my fortune, I didn't have to wait long before stumbling upon a Ziploc bag containing MJ and a grinder. I promptly disposed of the MJ down the toilet and discreetly returned the Ziploc bag to its original location. It appeared that she hid it outdoors to avoid arousing suspicion due to the smell. Since she often engaged in her activities in the backyard and her affair partner had once slipped away from there, I made the decision to move the camera from the living room to the backyard. My goal was to conceal it so that it wouldn't be too conspicuous. Once I had set up the camera, I conducted a test run and it performed well. This put me at ease, as I could now monitor the activities in my house without my wife having any clue about it. My next step is to install the GPS in her car once she returns from her visit to her mother's. My ultimate objective is to gather evidence against her for our eventual divorce. She came back home that Sunday evening and after she'd gone to bed, I discreetly installed the GPS device in her car. On Monday morning my daughter returned to her own place and during during my work hours I contacted the same divorce lawyer who had previously drafted our separation agreement. I laid out my situation for the lawyer, including my wife's infidelity. I asked how I could leverage the recorded evidence to my advantage, but he explained that it would have little impact on my divorce case, as our state operates under a no-fault divorce system. This means that we can only cite irreconcilable differences as the reason for our divorce, and my wife cannot be penalized for her infidelity by a judge. The lawyer assured me that the divorce paperwork would be ready the following day. I also confided in my friend the one I work for about my situation. He understood that I might have to leave work at any moment because the camera was linked to my phone while I was at my job, allowing me to monitor my wife's movements. On that particular day I observed my wife in the backyard searching for her MJ. She appeared quite frustrated but eventually returned inside the house. I had my phone on standby, ready to be alerted if she invited him over again. However, instead of that, she got into her car and drove away. 
Since I had the GPS installed in her car, I could track her location. She drove to an unfamiliar place and stayed there for about 30 minutes. Before returning home I marked the location for further investigation to find out where she had gone. I felt a bit disappointed that things didn't unfold as I had originally planned, but at least with the GPS in her car, I had some insight into her activities. When she came back home, she headed to the backyard, lit up some MJ and concealed the rest in the same spot. This confirmed my suspicion that she'd gone to meet him to obtain more update. One thing I forgot to mention is that once I discovered her infidelity, I got a test and it was okay. I saw someone on my camera and haven't been close with my wife since. I've been the one initiating it in our relationship, so she hasn't actively sought it from me. Moreover, she's already romantically involved with her affair partner and I strongly suspect that during her recent visit to him they most likely had a physical relationship. There was no other reason for her to spend 30 minutes at that location after work. I managed to trace the area she had visited and discovered that it was a mechanic shop. To my surprise, I spotted the unmistakable 1964 Pontiac GTO the same car I had seen on my street on the day. I almost caught someone fleeing from my backyard. I felt an intense anger. Knowing that this guy had been inside my house. I felt disrespected and had an urge to confront him right then and there. But I had to talk myself out of it. It's unsettling to think that he was so familiar with my backyard, suggesting he may have been there before. I parked my work van a few blocks away from his shop to observe it for a stakeout. It was getting late, but I remained there until I noticed him emerging from the shop with another friend. They had closed the garage doors of their shop and were standing in front, presumably smoking. I couldn't be certain if they were smoking cigarettes or MJ, as I was too far away to discern. I should have been on my way home, but I couldn't resist waiting and watching them deep down. I was comparing myself to him and questioning why my wife had chosen him over me, why she had opted to betray me with him. Something about his life excited her, something I couldn't replicate. Maybe she had grown weary of pretending to be a good person and had decided to reveal her true nature. After they finished smoking, he got into his car and drove off. I saw this as my opportunity to follow him and discover where he lived. He had already been to my house multiple times, engaged with my wife, so it seemed only fair that I should know where he lives, in the hope of disrupting his relationship with his girlfriend. Eventually, I want to hurt this man. Dark thoughts swirled in my mind. I had a concealed hand tool, a Springfield Hellcat, in my car. I thought about driving up to him and destoy him there. However, I realized that I'd probably become the prime suspect if they discovered he had been with my wife. He drove his car to a restaurant and picked up a woman. Initially, I assumed that the woman was his girlfriend, so I took some pictures with my phone. The pictures weren't very clear due to the fading light, but I knew I had to act fast, but I parked on the street to remain inconspicuous. He collected the female passenger and I trailed behind him. They arrived at an apartment building with street parking and I could discern from their body language that she wasn't his girlfriend. Their behavior indicated a strong attraction. As they couldn't keep their hands off each other while entering the apartment, my suspicion grew that she might be another one of the women he was involved with romantically. I pondered whether to wait for him to exit so I could follow him and uncover his residence. Yet, with no certainty of when he would leave, I opted to capture a picture of his license plate number and returned home for the day. Now I remembered thinking that this guy wasn't just a dealer, but also a total womanizer, with my wife being one of the women he was engaged with. The following days were exceedingly disheartening, and it became increasingly challenging to share a room with her. I was losing hope and contemplating ending it all, proceeding with the divorce so we could go our separate ways. I feared that sooner or later she would decipher the purpose of the ring doorbell, discover the voice activated recorder or detect the hidden camera I was using to spy on her. It was a monotonous week, observing her conversing with her affair partner and watching her on camera smoking in the backyard at least twice a day. I estimated that it might take her three to four weeks to deplete her MJ stash and I didn't want to wait that long. I couldn't endure living in the same house with her for such an extended period, knowing she was involved with another man. I wanted to bring this situation to a conclusion, so when she went to bed, I ventured into the backyard with my flashlight and excavated her bag of MJ. I noticed that it also contained a blend of tobacco and MJ. In any case, I removed more than half of the contents, returned the rest and then retired to bed. Update. After I left for work one morning, I observed her on camera smoking. I'm unsure if she noticed the reduction in the stash skipping ahead three days. I've been gathering all my documents in order. Besides the shared account, which doesn't hold substantial funds, and the house, which has already been paid off, there's nothing else that requires division except for our retirement savings. She has approximately 45000 in her 401k, whereas I have around $870,000 in my Roth account. I anticipate that she will try to claim a share of my Roth account. According to my lawyer, a portion of my retirement savings will need to be allocated to her due to the duration of our marriage. However, she is unaware of the exact amount in my Roth account, since she has always been passive about retirement planning. 
I was the one responsible for financial planning and earning money, while her role was primarily focused on spending. I even had to persuade her to open a 401k account nine years ago and she made minimal contributions. The bulk of the savings is essentially free money and she hasn't taken advantage of it. Her tendency has been to rely on me, all the while complaining that I work excessively or don't take enough time off. In reality, our plan was to retire early, motivating my hard work and dedication. Now that our children are grown, we intended to relocate to South America and spend the rest of our lives happily. However, it seems she prematurely checked out of our marriage and is now engaging in an affair. She is poised to take half of the work and effort I've invested a lot over the years. My lawyer said that in long marriages, retirement savings are usually divided fairly. I can't let that happen. I worked hard for my assets and I can't let them go to waste. I kept my end of the deal, being a loyal and caring husband, providing for my family, and working hard to make her happy. Despite all my efforts, she had a romantic relationship with another man, as heard in a voice recording. I don't believe she intends to leave me for him. It appears she's merely enjoying the excitement of a fling. I don't think she's willing to trade the stable life she has with me for an unpredictable seller, but she revels in the thrill. She mentioned this on the voice activated recorder. She can't contain her laughter at his remarks. He attempted to persuade her to leave me, even though he has a girlfriend and young children. I understand that listening to the voice activated recorder is emotionally taxing, considering the things she's saying about me. Nevertheless, it's crucial that I uncover the truth and understand her thoughts about me. She referred to me as boring and unadventurous, criticized my performance in bed and suggested that I didn't measure up to him, even dubbing me a five-minute man, which is not accurate. I suspect she was saying these things to boost his ego. He's only 32 years old, a younger age than I initially thought, possibly because the baseball group primarily consisted of individuals in their 40s, as I presume. He frequently complimented her, which bolstered her fragile self-esteem. I've come across instances on this site where younger men focus on middle-aged women with self-esteem issues, finding it easy to engage in intimate relationships with them. Using his license plate, I managed to uncover his place of residence and conducted some surveillance by driving past his house on a couple of occasions to keep an eye on him. During these observations, I noticed his girlfriend, and he has three children, all under the age of 10. One evening, while we were in bed, my wife initiated intimacy. I can't recall the last time this happened, but I informed her that I was too fatigued for it. She became upset because we hadn't been intimate for weeks. My reluctance to be close with her was due to the knowledge of her ongoing involvement with her affair partner. I mentioned that it had been a demanding week at work as an excuse. The truth is, I still find her physically appealing and I do desire intimacy with her. However, in my view, she has become tainted, similar to a person engaging in street solicitation, and I felt that engaging with her would legitimize her actions. Two days later, while I was at work, I received a notification from my ring doorbell and promptly checked it. It was him and my wife had invited him in. Similar to previous occasions, this time I wasn't far from home, only about 15 minutes away. I swiftly got into my car and headed back home, arriving in less than 10 minutes. On this occasion, I decided not to park my car in the driveway to avoid drawing attention, instead, parking on the street, I had my Hellcat, which I always carry in my car. Although I hadn't expected to use it, but I was emotionally prepared, having had time to contemplate such a moment. My intention wasn't to take a life, despite my strong desire to confront the man for showing disrespect. However, I had my personal protection, given that he is involved in dealing. I wasn't sure about his potential capabilities. My goal was to confront him at tool point and call the authorities. I hoped that he had MJ on him, which would lead to his arrest. I had my phone set to record, hanging it in my left shirt pocket to capture audio without needing to hold it. To avoid the front door, I chose to enter through the backyard fence, since I believe the backyard was his potential escape route. At this point, approximately 20 minutes had passed since I received the ring notification on my phone. I carefully slid the bolt of the wooden fence gate latch to open it from the outside, all while keeping my camera in my left pocket still recording. As I entered through the backyard door leading to the kitchen, I held my keys in my right hand and my Hellcat in my left. Both the backyard and the kitchen doors were wide open. There in my living room, I found my wife and the person she was involved with, both unclothed, engaging in an intimate act on the living room couch. Due due to the open floor plan, I could see the living room from my vantage point in the kitchen. I dropped my keys to free up my hands to hold my Hellcat. Both of them were surprised to see me. I immediately told them to lie down on the floor or face consequences. The man quickly complied and lay down. He was half-dressed, trying to put on his pants until I stopped him. While he was on the ground, my wife, now wearing a robe, tried to calm the situation by saying, I'm sorry, it's not what it seems. I made sure my left pocket camera was still recording because my left arm had partially obstructed the view. I continued to point my Hellcat at the affair partner, cursing at him. 
My wife, now wearing a robe, slowly attempted to rise. I allowed her to, as I was focused on the affair partner, and I ordered her to join him and stay flat on the ground. This action made it clear to her that I was serious and she promptly obeyed. Later I reviewed the recorded footage to gather these details. As my adrenaline had been running high, I knew I needed to establish control of the situation. Before contacting the police, with my wife on the floor apologizing and insisting that her affair partner Craig meant nothing to her, he began begging me not to harm him. I took out my phone and dialed emergency. I told the dispatcher that a dealer is selling to my wife in my house and I have them down at Hellcat. The police dispatcher instructed me not to take any action and to wait for the arrival of the police. After ending the call with the dispatcher, I instructed Craig to stretch both his hands forward while lying down and pleaded with him not to give me a reason to use force. My wife remained on the floor pleading with me. I walked over to the front door and swung it wide open, making it easy for the police to enter. When they arrived, I noticed a bag of MJ on the living room table. Although it wasn't a substantial amount, I hoped it would be sufficient for the police to arrest him. I waited for what felt like an eternity about five minutes. At this point I was tired of keeping both of them terrified, affied, all the while recording the entire incident. So I decided to FaceTime my daughter, despite my wife's pleas to refrain from doing so. My daughter witnessed her mother lying there with her semi-naked affair partner. I explained the situation to her and she began to cry, unable to believe what she was seeing. My wife felt embarrassed, her head hung low. As my daughter spoke, I heard the police vehicles pull into my driveway. They entered my house as I lowered my Hellcat. I approached them at the door and briefed them on the situation. Initially there were two officers, but two more soon arrived, making a total of four officers and two patrol cars. The first officers detained him for the MJ in the living room. He attempted to shift the blame onto my wife, claiming it was her MJ, not his. It was quite amusing to watch them both accusing each other of ownership, effectively incriminating themselves. My wife tried to deny it was hers, insisting it belonged to him, but he admitted to selling it to her, effectively relinquishing ownership in retrospect. I probably should have told the police it was my wife's, and you'll understand why later on. The police couldn't determine ownership definitively, so they detained both of them. Now there were three patrol cars parked in front of my house. They placed my wife in one of the patrol cars, allowing her to put on her clothing while she still had her robe on. It was an embarrassing moment, since all the police officers who were male saw my wife partially unclothed. I felt somewhat uncomfortable about it, but I had to remind myself that she was now a matter of public record due to her involvement with these unsavory individuals. Upon weighing the MJ, they found it to be around 4-0, which is close to being a state jail felony. However, one of the officers later told me privately that the judge might reduce the charge to a class 1 wanted the police to take strong action against my wife's affair partner if he was found to be in possession of marijuana. The police escorted him to his car to search for more marijuana, but he refused, stating they needed a warrant to do so. The cop replied that they had probable cause to believe the car contained evidence of criminal activities, since he had already admitted earlier to giving the MJ to my wife, essentially acknowledging his intention to distribute or sell it. It seemed as if all the police in my city had nothing else to do. Because more officers arrived, you would think a major pills bust was unfolding. Even the K-9 unit joined the scene, making it clear they were deterred to throw the book at this guy due to his prior criminal record. They were handling this case with significant force, attempting to secure a lengthy sentence for him. After their search they found approximately 4 pounds of MJ in his possession, enough for a state jail felony. This offense carries a mandatory minimum sentence of 180 days imprisonment, a maximum of 2 years imprisonment and a fine not exceeding $10,000. The evidence appeared solid, although the length of his prior offense offenses was uncertain, but it's likely he would face up to 2 years in prison. I'm not sure if an affair with another man's wife is worth all that trouble, but he chose the wrong person's wife to become involved with. They later charged him. With the MJ found in my house and released my wife. He was arrested and taken away, I informed the police that I wanted him charged with trespassing, but they explained that he couldn't be charged with trespassing because infidelity isn't a crime. His friend later came to retrieve his car, and he was invited by my wife. They mentioned that they might need me to come to the police station to provide additional statements, even though I had already given my statement. Once my wife was released from the police car, she rushed into the bedroom and locked herself in. My daughter called me, revealing that my wife had been trying to contact her, but she refused to answer. She asked me what had happened and I shared the whole story. She was in tears the entire time and, although I felt bad for live streaming the situation with my wife and her affair partner, it, it wasn't my fault. My wife had put us in this predicament and I wasn't the only one who should be experiencing the consequences. My daughter inquired about the next steps and I explained that I had already contacted and hired a real estate agent and we would be selling the house. I also mentioned that I had found a divorce lawyer and the divorce agreement had already been prepared. All that remained was to serve her with it. 
My daughter told me she would visit us next week after our conversation. I knew it would be difficult for her, as she is as very close to her mother. In the evening I had mixed emotions about the entire situation and my wife remained in the room. I felt a deep sense of sadness as our 22 years of marriage seemed to go down the drain. There were no heroes in this story and it wasn't how I envisioned our relationship ending. Just two years ago, my wife and I vacationed in South America, visiting countries like Uruguay, Chile and Peru, to look for houses to purchase. In just one year she had thrown everything away and I couldn't help but wonder why she carelessly invited him to our home. It was a shocking revelation. I'm relieved she did, because it revealed her true colors. Who knows, if she had done this before, he might not be her only affair. That evening I went to a local bar to have drinks with a friend. We discussed various topics, avoiding any mention of my wife in the earlier events. I was trying to divert my mind from the whole situation. While at the bar, drinking and chatting with my friend, my eldest son called. He had been informed by his sister about what had happened. He apologized for his mother's actions and expressed his willingness to support any decision I made. He understood that his mother had put everyone in this difficult position. This made me proud and emphasized that my son had matured. He also has a serious girlfriend and they've already moved in together. I used to give him relationship advice, but now I felt like I was the one in need of guidance. When I returned home that evening I didn't want to see my wife, so I chose to sleep in a different room. The following day I went to work and had a conversation with my youngest son. I confided in my friend about what had transpired and he offered his support. He also said he'd understand if I needed some time off to manage the divorce. I left work early to visit the lawyer's office before it closed. I collected the divorce agreement for my wife to sign and contacted the real estate agent to list the property for sale on the MLS. She informed me that she'd come by during the weekend to take some photos. When I returned home, my wife was waiting for me and expressed her readiness to talk. I told her I wouldn't engage in a conversation until she signed the divorce papers. She insisted that I allow her to speak first, promising to sign the divorce papers afterward. She even hinted that if I didn't let her talk she might prolong the divorce process. I reminded her that she was in no position to make threats. If she wanted a public divorce, I told her I was ready to go to the Supreme Court, which reassured her that I was serious. She asked me to bring the divorce papers for her to sign, and also wanted me to explain the terms of the divorce agreement before signing. I explained that we planned to sell the house and split the proceeds, with 60% going to her and 40% to me. She would receive the $4,000 currently in our joint account as part of the agreement. In return, she agreed to an amicable divorce and would not make any claims on my retirement. She found this arrangement fair and I concurred with her assessment. After she signed the papers, she expressed a desire to explain how the affair had started and the details of her involvement. To her surprise, I informed her that I was already aware of everything. I revealed that I had been monitoring and listening to her conversations with him through cameras and VRS, even showing her where she concealed her MJ. She was taken aback and fell silent. I didn't want to hear any justifications from her, as she understood the gravity of her actions. Her, her tears seemed like an attempt to gain sympathy from me, but I remained resolute, knowing that what's done is done. Edit. It has been two weeks since I've served my wife with divorce papers and we have 76 days left for the divorce to be finalized. The house hasn't been sold yet, but there are two potential buyers interested. My soon-to-be ex-wife and I are still living in the same house, sleeping in separate bedrooms. My daughter is not speaking with my wife anymore, and I'm trying to help them reconcile their relationship. My sons still maintain contact with their mother, but have significantly lost respect for her. I can certainly help with that. Here's a more engaging rewrite of the text you provided. I've accepted that my family dynamics have changed forever. As for her affair partner, I heard he was released on bail but is still awaiting his day in court. It's possible that he might end up with a prison sentence of more than two years. I'm hoping for the best.